Alison Gopnik, today's keynote speaker, is one of the world's most respected researchers in children's development. She's adding a wealth of knowledge and understanding to the body of scientific research about how children learn and why learning in infancy and early childhood is so important to a child's future potential. If perhaps you thought there was a shortcut whereby we could just cram letters and shapes and numbers into the preschooler's brain in the months before kindergarten, Dr. Gopnik will prove you wrong. Her research shows that the really big ideas, abstract thought, the understanding of cause and effect, understanding people's intentions, the stuff that makes us able to create and to think and plan comes from our explorations and our interactions with the world in our very first years of life. You will do hear Dr. Gopnik explain how children are learning long before they enter what is now considered formal schooling. And if, as we all believe, that education is the means of advancing the public good, then Doctors Gopnik, Dr. Gopnik's research really begs the question, which part of this education should be public education? Well, I'm so absolutely delighted to be here with all of these people who are doing uh, this wonderful work, wonderful work to help children. So now the very idea that not just children but very young children, babies and children under the age of five could tell us anything about these big aspects of the human condition would have seemed just crazy to philosophers and psychologists and psychiatrists and pediatricians 30 years ago. Even the great developmental psychologist Piaget thought that children were egocentric, illogical, pre-causal, amoral, um, that they lived in a buzzing, blooming confusion, that their minds were blank slates. And over the last 30 years, we've discovered that exactly the opposite is true. In fact, in the last 30 years, we've discovered that babies know more, learn more, think more, care more, experience more than we ever would have thought in the past. Now, one question you could ask is, why were we so wrong about babies for so long? And I think the answer was that not all of us were wrong about babies. The people who actually spent time with babies and young children, I think, always had the sense that there was more going on there than other people thought. But for most of that time, the people who were taking care of babies and young children were not the people who were writing philosophy and psychology and uh, psychiatry. And after all, if you just look cursorily at a baby or a young child, uh, in fact, it won't look as if there's very much going on. After all, babies aren't talking. And if you ask a three-year-old a question, you'll get a gorgeous stream of consciousness monologue, but it won't sound like uh, what they're saying is very smart. So what we had to do was figure out ways to ask children questions about what they thought and know in their language instead of our language. And that meant looking at what babies do rather than just looking at what they say. Um, even doing things like looking at what babies look at. And over the last 30 years, we've used these techniques of looking at what babies do instead of just what they say to really revolutionize our ideas about babies and young children. Uh, now, as I say, I'm approaching this question from the perspective of a scientist, a scientist who wants to understand how people work in general. And the kinds of tools that we scientists use are thinking about uh, people in the context of evolution and thinking about them in the context of brains and brain development. So what I'm going to do first is say a few words about both the evolution of childhood and what we know about the neuroscience of childhood. So first of all, one of the big questions about babies that sort of surprisingly never got asked for those thousands of years is, why do we have babies at all? Um, not why do we actually produce them, we know why that happens, but why is it that as a species we have this long period of immaturity? After all, you can make a pretty good argument that babies are basically useless. Um, in fact, I think there's maybe a baby in the audience I heard before, but with all due apologies, they don't bring home any, uh, they don't bring home a salary, they don't even help very much with doing the dishes. In fact, they're sort of worse than useless because all of us have to put so much time and energy into taking care of them. Um, and in fact, if you look at human babies, our babies are actually useless for longer than the babies of any other species. So um, if you look across species, 
our babies are immature, they're dependent, they rely on us to take care of their most basic and fundamental needs much longer than the babies of any other species. Um, in fact, my oldest son is 31, and um, sometimes until they're 31, we're still paying the deposit on the mortgage. Um, now, why would that be? Why would our babies be designed to be so helpless for so long? Well, it turns out that when you actually look uh, uh, across different animal species, you see a rather surprising thing. What you see is that there's a correlation between how smart the adult animals are, particularly how good they are at learning, how flexible they are, how creative they are, and how immature the babies are. And this set of discoveries came from people who weren't thinking about people at all. They were actually looking at birds. And the poster children for this uh, uh, discovery within evolutionary biology are, are actually these different categories of birds. So on one side, you can see uh, an example of what biologists call an altricial bird. An altricial bird is a bird who's immature for a long time. Namely, that's a New Caledonian crow. And that picture actually comes from the cover of Science Magazine because these crows are incredibly intelligent birds. And that's a picture of a crow who's actually learned how to bend a wire so that he can pull up that hook and get the food that's in that machine. Um, recent experiments suggest that crows in many ways are even smarter than primates like chimpanzees, especially when it comes to things like tool use. Um, on the other side, again with apologies to any chicken lovers in the audience, is the domestic chicken. And, and basically, chickens are dumb as stumps. I mean, chickens are really good at pecking at grain, but that's about it as far as chicken intelligence goes. Um, and chickens are an example of what's called a precocial species. They're a species that, whose young mature much more quickly. So crow babies can depend on the crow adults for as long as a year, a year and a half, which is a really long time for a bird. Um, so what you see is that you, so why would this be? Why would you have this correlation between immaturity and learning? And the answer seems to be that evolution uh, designed species in different ways. Some species, like the chickens, seem to be incredibly well designed to do just one thing, to survive in one evolutionary niche, really good at pecking grains. Other species, like the crow, are very good at learning. They can go into any environment, like this new environment with this new uh, machine they've never seen before, and they can learn how to handle that environment. That's an incredibly powerful evolutionary uh, strategy, and of course it's the one that we human beings use more than any other species, but it has one big disadvantage. And that disadvantage is that while you're waiting to learn, you're helpless. So you don't want to actually have the mastodon charging at you and be thinking, what would be a good tool for dealing with this situation? Should I try a stone? Maybe a spear would work? You really want to know about all that before you actually have to deal with the mastodons of adult life. And the way that nature seems to have solved that problem is to give species that depend a lot on learning uh, a period of immaturity in which they can just learn. And again, if you think about human beings, we're the species that survives in more different environments than any other species. And we, not only that, but we create our own environment. We're the species that relies more on learning and creativity and flexibility than any other. And our babies are immature for the longest. Now, from that perspective, what that means is that literally, babies are for learning. That's what babies are for. Um, so babies and young children are designed to learn. That's their uh, role in human evolution. One way that I like to think about it is that you could think about the babies as being like the R&D department of the human species. And we're production and marketing. So the babies are the blue sky guys who just get all, to go off there by themselves. Everybody leaves them alone. They get to think up all these weird, crazy ideas. And we'll talk about some of those weird, crazy ideas later on. Just sit and learn and have a good time. And then we, as adults, take the things that we've learned as children and put them to use to do all the important production and, production and marketing and predation and reproduction and all the things that we have to do as adults.